you can ask questions at the beginning of class. So, um, does anyone have questions now? <laughs> Yes. So you won't have the same number of components. You won't have the same number of components upstairs as downstairs. So. No, no, so suppose she, the, the base is connected. Yes. The, 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 the cover is disconnected. Yes, yes. Now, can we, can we mix the, the structures? Component, so as to see as only one group? No. I think even the following might be an issue. If I say, if uh, so G is connected, right, and uh, uh, say, you know, and I form a bigger group by adding a finitely many or infinitely many components, right, it's not cl clear if I can even add components to G tilde to get the same number of components. That's not quite so clear, I don't believe. So take, take a connector group, take a covering, right? And I want to add components. So I can add, let's say I know how to add some components on G, right? Can I, is there is there, uh, is there a home office like that? Right. And that may not be true. Um, it's possibly true if I change the group gamma, but then I might have to have more components upstairs and downstairs. Um, so like, what's an issue? If I take, say, a, a gamma in gamma, which lies in a different component, right? then if I look at uh, conjugation by gamma, let's call this identity components. Let's make it sort of, so. say this is connected, right? Then uh, this takes the identity component into the identity component, right? So just because it's uh, G naught is connected, so conjugation takes that to that. And this is an automorphism. Of G naught. So even can I lift this automorphism to an automorphism of, of, the, of the covering here? That. So uh, how can I view other components? I can view them. I can understand them by looking at what conjugation does to the anti component. Right. It's like an extension of the group. Uh, um, this is normal in the whole group, right? So the. Identity component is normal in the whole group. And I can see how these other components act on, on the identity components and automorphism. Right? Uh, it may not be inner, because gamma lies in different components. It may not be conjugation by something in G0. But it certainly is some automorphism. And can I lift this into an automorphism of the, of the covering group? Right, does it lift? May not be the case. So that's a, that's a tricky question, right? If I have a disconnected group, in, in, a, uh, in what sense, how does curry make sense and how do I lift things? That's not so obvious. Um, and even if it does lift, like it, it could say, say I have an, uh, this is say an element of order two, right, square identity, so it's an atom of order two. If it lifts, it may have an order four upstairs. Order four upstairs. The square could be in the kernel of the covering. So then the group upstairs is going to be different. So this might have two components, if, and this might have four components. But in general, I, I mean, I even lift it as an automorphism, and then you're stuck. Right, so that, that's a good question. Of course, I mean, one case where, where it's easy, say, if this is trivial, so if it commutes, with gamma naught, right? It might be just a direct product of G naught with a finite group. Of course, then you can just do it. So somehow those elements 
that acts trivially by conjugation. They're the easy elements. Certainly, I can lift them. But again, let them act trivially on the, on the cover. Okay. But those that induce an automorphism, which is non-trivial, those I may or may not be able to lift. And if lifted, it may have higher order, higher order. And that's a different group. So it's subtle. I don't know an example, uh, say, I'm sure this one could find this, say, uh, Well, so one should think of an example, say, of some covering where this does not, where this does not lift. Let me think about that. But so the issues are subtle. Anyway, that's certainly true. Okay. Any other questions? So let me a little bit what we did about automorphisms. So we had an automorphism of the Lie algebra. Because I can also define automorphisms of the group. So uh, isomorphism of groups that uh, uh, are Lie group isomorphisms of groups. That's the Lie algebra isomorphism of the Lie algebra. Right? So both of these are groups I can define. Uh, this here sits inside the endomorphism of the algebra. Uh, sorry, inside the endomorph inside GLG, sorry. This is clearly a Lie group because it's closed inside here. here it's not so obvious it's a Lie group. Uh, so why is this a Lie group? Um, it doesn't sit naturally inside something else where it's closed, which I know is a Lie group. Like, like this one does here. Um, so here's one way one can do that. Uh, so let me just indicate without doing the details. Uh, look at the universal cover. And I guess here I probably want to assume G is connected. Otherwise, I may have to <laughs> change my argument a little bit, although it's also group two and G is not connected. <laughs> but again, one has these issues. Look at the universal cover. Um, so now it's, it's a question, ah, okay, it's actually the same kind of question we just discussed. If I have uh, some uh, automorphism of the groups so or some homomorphism from G to G, uh, when does it lift? Let's look at the other way around. If I have some homomorphism from G tilde to G tilde. Ah, okay. So, ah, okay. Yes, yes. There exists a lift because it's simply connected. So this lift is... Right. So I'm taking the rest of the cover. This is trivial. Conversely, what automorphisms are G tilde descend? Right. So here the question is when does there exist... Uh, from G to G, such that the foreign diagram commutes. So it descends in that sense. Again, that's the covering issue if you want to. It's not, not much to do with automorphisms. If I have a diffeomorphism of the universal cover, or of any cover, when does it descend? So what's the issue? Um, this here has a certain fiber, right? Yeah. If it descends, it must take fiber to fiber. Yeah. Pardon? If this guy commutes or with almost, or almost. It doesn't have to commute. You're almost right. So uh, oh, okay. uh, yeah. yes, if it normalizes it yeah. exactly. So <laughs> that gamma be the kernel of uh, of uh, pi or the covering. Okay. And I claim C exists if and only if, uh, if 
Okay. Uh, let's see how to press it. C must take the current to the current, I guess, right? That. Right, what's the fiber of a point? I take the some pre dimension multiply with the current, right? This is the whole fiber. Fiber must go to fiber, then it descends, just points that wise. Right? And so this condition uh, guarantees that it descends. And of course, since T is an isomorphism, I have a quality here. So I want to this true. Right? So what's out G? Uh, the setup elements uh, C in out G tilde such that C of gamma is equal to gamma. That's what our G is downstairs. Only certain automorphisms upstairs, which descend, which from descend are defined by this equation. Now it's closed. So it's a least subgroup. Therefore, it's a Lie group. Okay. So you can't show, show directly because uh, uh, you have to go somewhat over the universal cover like this. Uh, OK, what else did we have? We had also uh, derivations. Um, and we had inner derivations. We have derivations for something of the form at x. Right, this was inside all the other derivations. And then we had a sequence of corresponding D groups in D algebras in G contained in uh, out G contained in uh, uh, anamorphism of G, uh, GLG. And then a corresponding uh, sequence of uh, the algebras of these groups. Inner derivations contained in derivations contained in anamorphism algebra. And this was also the algebra of this here. And this was normal. This was a normal subgroup. This was an ideal. Okay. So those are the things we discussed. And now we also have the automorphism of G. This said that, uh, particularly that out G mod in G is a Lie group. Uh, I want to be a bit careful. If I really want to prove that, make that rigorous, there's something that's not quite so obvious. It's certainly a group, but it's a normal subgroup. So the quotient is a group structure, as usual, right? It's a group. Why is it a manifold? Pardon? Yes, it's a closed subgroup. OK. Yes, yes. So a theorem I should use here, the general theorem, is that if H containing G is closed, then G mod H is a manifold. such that the projection from G mod G into G mod H is a submersion. So if we divide by a closed subgroup, I can always make it into a manifold. Right, so this is a theorem that's, that's uh, not quite, that's non-trivial, requires some work. Done very carefully in Warner's book, for example, if you look at Frank Warner's book on manifolds. You prove that very carefully. At some point when we need more serious, seriously, I may indicate the proof, but that's, that's, right now let's just uh, accept that. I have to use the theorem also in this one exercise where I said take a homomorphism from H into G, uh, which is onto, then uh, H mod the kernel of phi is isomorphic to G. This was an exercise. So I have to convince myself that this quotient here is a manifold. Again, this is normal in here, so it's the same issue. Right? So it's something one has to use at some point. OK, so let's just review in there. Ah, maybe uh, uh, one more comment. So I have this kind of quotient here. Um, 
of out mod int. And these are called the outer automorphisms. Or the outer, outer automorphism group. That's right, so automorphisms which aren't inner. Remember, in G is given by, uh, where is it? Uh, this could also be described by up G mod the center. So, uh, by the, sorry, by the image of up G, which was G mod the center of G. Right, and the, the map was given by taking an element in G and, and go to up G. That conjugation, right, so that's, that's the map. So in G I can view as, those are just the conjugations. So what are outer morphisms are there which aren't given by conjugation? Right, and how, how big is this group here? That's an interesting question. Maybe some, some examples. Uh, well, I say a, a trivial example is Rn. And of course, in G is trivial. It's every conjugation of the entity. It says nothing in G. And how big is out G? So what's out G? Yeah. Anything, right? G L right, exactly, G L G. So if uh, um, if G is uh, GLNC, C, I claim that out G mod in G is E two. So I claim as one out automorphism. Everything else is inner. Okay. And uh, uh, the outer, outer morphism is easy to see. In fact, maybe you can guess what uh, might be outer. A very simple kind of outer morphism. Which doesn't work in GLR, but works in GLNC. Yeah, conjugation, right? A goes to A bar. That respects the border structure. But it's certainly an element of the Adamovson group. Um, why is it not inner? So I claim it's not conjugation. Is what? So, is it different office? No. I couldn't hear the word. So. Okay. So if I look at conjugation, right? Uh, so A goes to B A B inverse. I could distinguish that from this one. What can I say about the eigenvalues when I conjugate? They're the same, right? Conjugated matrix, it's the same eigenvalues. D takes eigenspaces to eigenspaces with the same eigenvalue, right? And of course, what happens here, if I have an eigenvalue lambda, it goes to lambda bar. Therefore, there they can't be. Uh, this automorphism can't be of this form. So it shows at least that the group is not trivial. What's not opposite at all is that there, that's there, that is just C two. There's nothing else. Just conjugation. Something we're going to prove later on. Say, uh, highly non-trivial result. If G is simple, if G has no ideals, uh, 
and this group of automorphism out g mod in g is finite. So it's a finite group. Okay. Unlike uh, in this case here, of course. That's, a, that's the opposite if you want to. If it has no ideals, then, then it's finite. We'll do the proof of this uh, later on. And it's typically only Z2. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small group. OK. So this was uh, things about automorphisms. Of course, if, uh, so one consequence of this is uh, if that's true, then uh, the Lie algebras are the same, right? And derivations of G are inner derivations. Right, because this group is finite, so this Lie group and this Lie group must have the same Lie algebra. So that's an important fact. Any derivation of the Lie algebra, I can write as adx. That's what it means, right? That if A is a derivation, this implies A must be adx. So that's another way of interpreting that. And that's an important fact, that every derivation is a new derivation. OK, so that's, a, that's a not so easy to prove. So if, if you are already have seen things like semi simple algebras and root space decomposition, one has to use all that structure in order to prove this. Um, someone know what the Dinkin diagram is, for example? Anyone had a course on Lie algebras already? No? OK. It's, it's a symmetry of the Dinkin diagram. That's what this group is. That's what one proves. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk about that now. I talked about complexification, right? If I had uh, G real, then G tends to C is a complex Lie algebra. Uh, if uh, G was complex and H is a real form, if complexification is isomorphic to G, right, I can complexify, I can try to go backwards, uh, then it's a, it's a real form. Not all uh, Lie algebras have real forms, so you can't always go back. And one of the exercises gives a nice example. Let's see where it was. It's a very simple three-dimensional Lie algebra. So G is spanned by three vectors, x, y, and z. And uh, x and y commute. x and z is x. And y and z is a y. Um, and here I view it as a complex Lie algebra. So x and y z is a complex space of so a complex Lie algebra. So a here could be a complex number. And that's fixed. So fix a complex number. And define Lie brackets like this. There's something you have to verify for this to make sense. What do I have to verify? Co-identity. Because I make this too symmetric, so zx is minus x, obviously, right? But then I have to verify the co-identity. So there's a couple of cases I have to look at, right? <laughs> so that uh, everything works out. And so check the co-identity. And then the exercise is that g has a real form. If and only if. Well, there's one case where it's obvious. In which case do I obviously have a real form? Sorry, is that a question? Is that a question? Please ask it publicly. Everyone else has the same question, I'm sure. Uh, I was thinking if it was the case of the Heisenberg book, but it's not. No, it's not the Heisenberg book. Heisenberg book is simpler, actually. So what's an obvious case where it has a real form? When A is real. Yeah. So certainly A is real. 
then I just look at the real Lie algebra. It's defined by this complexifier, I get the complex one, right? Or, and that's the interesting case, A is complex and norm A is equal to 1. Then it's also the complexification of some real Lie algebra. And one of the exercises uh, that we might want to discuss at some point is that, that this is true. So things in general don't have real forms. Uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, Lie algebra can have many real forms. And we'll see an example in a minute. But generally, Lie can have many real forms. Um, one more concept is a complex conjugate Lie algebra which is important. Um, so the idea is you, what is complex conjugation? You multiply i by minus 1 if you want to, right? So I like to view things uh, a little bit abstractly. More what's a complex Lie algebra? One way I can look at a complex Lie algebra is that I have a complex structure. Such that it respects uh, Lie brackets. So it must be complex linear. That's another way of using complex Lie algebra. Right? J squared minus identity is exactly what a complex structure looks like on the vector space. Right? So of course, multiplication by i, if I view this in the usual way, is would be j. Right? And it's complex linear. I have multiplication by i pulls out, so I can express it this way in terms of j. And whenever I have this structure, that's a complex Lie algebra. And now, the, in this case, I can easily write down what g bar is. g bar is uh, g comma minus j. Right? Just multiply g by minus i. That's another complex structure. Well, it's different. And you might think that, well, that's uh, g and g bar has to be the same d algebra. What am I doing? I just multiply i by minus 1. And that's not true. Uh, g and g bar may not be the same. Take this sum of g with j and g bar with minus j. I get the complexification. Say that again. I, I, if I take the sum, the sum of g and g bar. G from yes. I, say, I, I get the, the complex part. Of the real Lie algebra. So. <laughs> Uh, yes. So that's a, that's a theory of my notes. I don't think I don't think I want to discuss it. Proof is a uh, is a little bit tricky, but not hard. If G is complex, ah, okay, maybe I didn't I didn't say this. So another thing I can say: if G is complex, and I can look at the forget about the complex structure. And so maybe this is a real Lie algebra. Forget about multiplication by i of twice the dimension, of course. Mm -hmm. okay. So if g is complex, I can take the real form, and I can complexify again. Now I get a complex Lie algebra of twice the dimension of the complex Lie algebra g. And the statement is isomorphic to g plus g bar. Um, that's a very cute proof. but. Uh, often in books, it's really confusing when they prove this, uh, but it becomes much easier if you view the complex Lie algebra as there is some endomorphism J, give it a name, then it's easier to keep things apart. Because in here, I have two multiplications by I, and one coming from this complexification. I can, in G, I can also multiply by I. That's a different I. So here, I'm talking about two different complex structures, and you better not confuse them. So you have to give them different names. So that's the uh, subtlety in, in this. But maybe I don't want to give the proof now. It's, it's done well in the exercises. Maybe another kind of fact, easy fact. Uh, when is G isomorphic to G bar? I'm playing if and only if. There exists a, a complex antilinear. Automorphism. So let's call it L from G to G. 
what is complex antilinear mean if I multiply by, by some lambda, comes out as a lambda bar. Right, so this, uh, this is what I mean by a complex antilinear automorphism. So it must respect the Lie brackets in the usual sense, right? but uh, it doesn't quite respect multiplication by i. It takes i to i bar. And clearly, if these are isomorphic here, uh, then this isomorphism is a linear map. It's an automorphism, but it takes a multiplication by i into, into minus i here. Right, so that's kind of the issue. Um, so what Lie algebra has an obvious complex antilinear automorphism. So then I just take A to A bar. It's not a morphism. It's complex antilinear this sense here. This means for G L and C, G bar is the same thing as G. It doesn't, doesn't change. I bet the following thing is true, but <laughs> I must admit I didn't check it. Uh, G is equal to GL and R doesn't. Oh, sorry, GL and R doesn't make sense. It has to be complex the other. Uh, what's an example where they are different? So it has to be complex Lie algebra. Okay, I don't remember offhand. Maybe in the, when we go through examples, we might see something. You, you might think, well, isn't that always true? Because right, every complex D algebra has an embedding into G L N C for some large N. This was Arrow's theorem, right? Uh, you have a, have a complex antilinear automorphism. Well, I don't, why don't they have that here? Not necessarily, because what may not be true? If this thing here preserves it, then you do. Right, so if uh, A lies in G, and for some reason, if I look at the defining equations, A bar also lies in G, then of course I get again that G is uh, isomorphic to G bar. So the restriction of this would be my compass antilinear automorphism. But for some Lie algebras, uh, this is not true. I think we might see something later on. But it's probably not an if and only if. I don't think that a subalgebra here uh, satisfies this if and only if it's preserved by conjugation. That's unlikely. Um, and the question how do you prove that G is not isomorphic to G bar? There's another case where it's uh, clearly isomorphic. Uh, and if G has a real form, say. So H tends to C is isomorphic to G. I claim now I have a complex antilinear automorphism. Because I. I um, So at, this is a tensor product, right? So x tensor complex number. I put that into x tensor a minus i b. Now to verify that this extends to an automorphism, which is not hard. So this would then be complex antilinear. So if I have a real form, then they're isomorphic. So. But 
as you saw, not all here, the others have real form. So it's well, so maybe the ones I wrote down here, uh, maybe there might be examples where G is not isomorphic to G bar. Maybe we can talk about that example in the proper session at some point. OK, so this was the last general topic. I want to discuss complexification um, Realification, if you want to, right? I can reify, realification, complexification, and real forms. So these are three important concepts. Okay, now I'm going to go through a whole sequence of examples. Um, first is various versions of the of an orthogonal group. Let's see, I have a B as a for a moment, a real vector space. You can also do it with the complex numbers. And say I have an uh, inner product on it, so this will be a bilinear form. And symmetric. But now I want to look at such a, a bilinear form which has a signature. So I want to say that, well, this has signature p comma q. Uh, you know what that means? What does it mean for a bilinear form to have signature p q? <coughs> There's a basis the matrix in this basis uh, one, 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 Up plus one up to Up plus Q, such that um, U I in a product Uj is zero, so it's, it's a thorn basis, and uh, Ui Ui is minus one, and U for so Ui Ui is uh, uh, so one for I equals one to P and minus one for i is equal to p plus one to p plus q. Oh, another way of saying the same thing is that uh, in that basis, so if I write a vector then uh, v as summation a i u i, uh, then the inner part between u and v is uh, summation uh, a i b i i equals one to p minus summation a i b i i equals p plus one to q. Okay. Now you have to convince yourself that this is independent of the choice of such a basis, right? So there is a little exercise one has to do here uh, to make this uh, well defined. Because a way one could define uh, P independently of any choice of basis uh, would be, so how would you do that? What's the definition of P independent of choice of any basis? It's kind of an abstract definition. What is P? Maximum uh, dimension of W, W containing V, such that such that the inner product to this to W is uh, positive. Right, so in other words, u comma u is positive for all u and w. Right. That's, an, that's an invariant defined concept. Right. Once you have that, then it's a, a little exercise which is easy to find there is such an orthonormal base like this. Okay. We are taking all the degenerate. Pardon? Ah, okay, you're right. Thank you. And absolutely uh, non degenerate. So that should be uh, in the definition over here. So one signature PQ and two, it must be non degenerate. Otherwise, this exercise is false. Absolutely. Right. So non degenerate means what? Just 
has no kernel, right? So if uh, mu v is equal to 0 for all v, well, this implies that u is equal to 0. So the kernel of the bilinear form is 0. Right? So that's a uh, inner part of the sequence of PQ. Bilinear form, symmetric, on degenerate. And this is how I can describe it if I want to. So once I have that, so of course, say when Q is 0, I just get a, a usual kind of inner product that's positive definite. Right? So that's a special case. But uh, um, so. So that's, that I would call a metric. Right? So that's a metric on the vector space. Q is equal to 1 is also special. So that uh, is important in, in, in relativity. Right? So it's often called a Lorentz metric. An uh, important difference between all these inner products is that uh, if I look at the unit sphere, they behave very differently. So in, uh, if q is equal to 0, it's just my ordinary unit sphere. Right? The ticket's compact. Um, but when q is uh, not 0, then this uh, is not compact. For example, Q is equal to 1. Uh, what does that look like? So the unit sphere, we can look at it uh, in a part of this fashion here. Right? So that means uh, A1 squared plus AP squared minus AP plus 1 squared equal to 1 like a hyperboloid. So this is my last coordinate. Uh, so what does that look like? Points in this direction, I guess. What is it? Is that what it looks like? A perp like that. Uh, in this in this direction, in this p-dimensional space, I have vectors which have positive lengths. In this space here, I have vectors which have less negative lengths. It's come to do it the other way around. So often, say in general relativity, you look at the unit sphere where this is minus one. So then there are here oriented in this fashion. Right, so that's the unit sphere uh, in uh, Lorentz space. But it has two components, right? It's not compact, it has two components. Um, another thing that's special in this case in, for these kind of inner products is that you have vectors of length zero, right? So uh, you can make this equal to zero. The lawn space looks like a light, a light cone. It's going down this direction, so I get a kind of a, a cone of vectors of length zero. Of course, when P is, when Q is bigger than one, then you get the corresponding uh, corresponding picture. So Q is equal to zero, and Q is big positive is very different, very different to behave. But in both cases, I can, I can talk about matrices that preserve the inner product. So uh, um, O or V is a set of uh, linear maps such that A U A V is equal to U V. Um, the equivalent way of saying that is that the length is preserved. So that's true if and only if this is true. Why is that? 
kind of a standard trick. So certainly one direction is obvious, if this is true, this is true, to go from here to here, what do you do? Yes, so by, what is that called, it has a name. Polarization, there you go, polarization formula, right. By polarization formula you get the other direction also. So preserving lengths or preserving inner product either way. Um, I uh, identify often V with Rn by sending some basis, orthonormal basis into the basis EI. Because orthonormal basis now means this, right? So the electors, the first P have length one and the last one length minus one. So I would call this an orthonormal basis. So we have an orthonormal basis. And then, like I said, in this basis, if I look at the inner part between two vectors, u and v, I get the sum of the components with a sign. I can write that in a different form. Write it as uh, u transpose i p q u, where IPQ is a diagonal matrix which has plus ones in the first P spots, minus ones in the last P spots. And you I want to regard as a row or column vector. Let's see. It's a column vector, I guess, right? And U is U1 up to U. P plus Q. So then the last components are multiplied by minus one. That's exactly what that does. So when, when I do that, uh, OV is identified with uh, the set of matrices. Uh, GLRN, the matrix form which satisfies the equation, uh, a transpose IPQ times A is equal to IPQ. So uh, uh, to do that, I just use this interpretation of the inner product. Right? Was it, what does it mean to preserve the inner product? Left hand side becomes uh, um, AU transpose. IPQ, uh, AV, right hand side is a U transpose IPQ, V, and the left hand side is an uh, U transpose, A transpose IPQ, A. Right, this must be true for all U and V. So that means that uh, this matrix here must be equal to this matrix here. Uh, in the matrix form, and write matrix form, it's common to write this to give it a, the name OPQ. In fact, in this abstract way, if I define it this way, it's not a priori clear. I have to then say, well, my the signature is P, Q, right? And uh, so then I call it OPQ. When Q is equal to zero, I call it OP. And Q is equal to one, I have OP comma one, and this is the Lorentz group. So all isometries, if you want, of the Lorentz inner part, it's called the Lorentz group, and that's what one has to study in general relativity. Okay, so when I, uh, that's my, that's my Lie group. I often identify this OV with OPQ when I want to compute. It's often easier to do with matrix form. Sometimes you have an abstract vector space, so it's also useful to do it like that. Um, uh, 
uh, another thing I can see right away from this equation is uh, is what? So if A transpose I A is equal to I P Q, what can I say about that A? Plus one or minus one, right? So the square is one. The term goes away. Right? So it must be plus or minus one. So at least I have two components clearly, right? So this group must have two components. Um, and then I, saw, I say S of OV or S of uh, P comma Q. How the set of matrix will determine this for one? That's clearly a subgroup. Right. Uh, SOPQ, it's not necessarily connected. Um, when Q is, say, positive, I can do, I claim there's another component. And that's one, certainly one distinction between Q0 and Q positive. Think of the geometry. What else can my uh, linear map do? Think of the unit sphere. Right? Anything that's uh, orthogonal must preserve the unit sphere, must take it to itself. And what can you do? There are two components to the unit sphere, right? I could, you could switch them around. And that clearly gives you two different components. You can't go from one to the other continuously. So I can say uh, that's often called O plus P comma Q. S O, well, say O plus P comma Q. Sorry. Matrix A and uh, O P comma Q. Let's see, which way I can I say that? Um, Good way to say that. So it takes one component of the unit sphere into the other component of the unit sphere. So how can I just how can I think of the two components? In terms of the the last coordinates, right? If you want to. So if it, uh, say, if uh, u is a vector, where, say, u p plus 1 is uh, positive, then a u can be a vector where the p plus first component is either positive or negative. Positive means I'm preserving this part of it. Negative means I'm preserving this part of it. And I can't go from one to the other. So I get another component. Of course, only if I have, if it's not positive definite, right? If Q is positive. And then, of course, I can take also S of that. So I have at least four components. And the claim is that's it. But that's not obvious that there are only four components. That we're going to see uh, uh, a little bit later. I claim for the orthogonal group, that's good enough. So Q is equal to zero. And then we call it ON and with SON. And I claim this is connected. And they're both compact. First, why is it clearly compact? Why is it clearly a compact D group? Pardon? So why? <laughs> uh, okay, that's a good yes. What does this mean? 
it means the rows or the columns on an orthonormal basis. That's equivalent, right? It makes be orthogonal. So that's clearly closed and bounded now. Yeah, that's compact. Okay. So that's a compact group. And that's not true for the other ones. If Q is positive, uh, it's not going to be true, but it's not quite, not quite obvious at the moment. Uh, why is SON connected for the orthogonal group? So in the linear algebra course, you should have learned about the normal form of an orthogonal matrix. Determines one, yes. Why does that mean it's connected? Like in this case, it wasn't, it wasn't sufficient, right? There's another component, so a priori not so clear. You know what the normal form of an orthogonal matrix, what they look like? By what? So, yeah, what kind of matrix are they conjugate to, right? So by normal form, I mean when I conjugate, or equivalent when I choose a different basis. Right? What's the simplest form that it has if I choose an appropriate basis? Identity. identity? Not everything's conjugate identity. Identity. Right, so I look at... What's the simplest form that an orthogonal matrix A takes by choosing A appropriately, by choosing R appropriately. What's the Jordan form? It's a real matrix, right? It's not complex. So when I talk about Jordan form, I usually talk about a complex matrix, right? Things along the diagonal, the eigenvalues are something above, nothing below. That's what I mean by the Jordan form. That's only true for a, for a complex matrix. Cos sine. Yes. There you go. So it's a... It has a block form in an appropriate basis. Cosine theta 1 minus sine theta 1, sine theta 1, cosine theta 1. So I'm going to call this uh, kind of block matrix uh, by rotation by theta 1. The future, and then have another rotation here. And so on. Uh, the, I have to worry about the tail end. What can I say about the tail end? They can't all be rotations because then it's even, right? Then it would be an even matrix. So what could happen? Plus or minus one. That's the last one. Can be plus or minus one. And of course, these have determinant one, right? So as long as it has rotation, it's determinant one. And this tells me whether it has determinant plus or minus one. I mean, let's call it epsilon. Epsilon is plus or minus 1. And then that A, which doesn't change on the conjugation, is epsilon. Okay. Do you know how to prove that? There's a real proof and there's a complex proof, as usual. What would be the complex proof? If you see it's a matrix acting on the specified space, this diagonal itself. That what? Say that? You can that. Analyze, analyze right. So now you use a, what's that called, a something theorem, right? Every can complexify, it becomes unitary. Yes. Unitary matrix can be diagonalized. What can I say about that? And the diagonal entities are the eigenvalues. Right? What can you say about an eigenvalues? Those are roots of unity. Roots of unity, right? so which is two unitary matrix. The the right. So then, and of course, one more fact that roots of unity and. So they look like. Ah, and they come by pairs. And they come by pairs. They compass conjugate pairs because the matrix is real. 
this would be, but of course, this is now a complex subspace, it's not real. Now we have to find a complex basis, a real basis of that, and then interpret as a rotation. That'll be one proof. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So that's how I improve it. Okay. So now I can, now it's uh, uh, what I wanted to prove that this is connected is easy. The term one meant that this last entry doesn't occur, right? This is plus one. So how can I now change the matrix? Because uh, a little bit careful because this matrix was uh, was uh, R A R inverse. It's not A itself, right? It's a conjugate of it. By the way, so if it, uh, you can show that R lies, I can do this with an orthonormal basis. So I can make the change of course orthonormal. It's another thing one can prove. So how do I show it's connected now? So put a T in front of the theta, I say. That's continuous. Let T go towards 0. Then I get that the identity is uh, R, A, R inverse. Because if I want to deform A, I conjugate back, right? Multiply with R and R inverse on the left. So A is the conjugate of this. R I leave alone. And this one I change by an angle T. It goes to identity, and of course then uh, uh, A's identity. So I get a continuous deformation from A to identity just by changing the angles. Okay. Um, this group, I don't know what the normal form is actually. What's the normal form for a, a, a Thorgo matrix with an indefinite inner product? I can guess what it is. Or oh, I bet I know what it is. So what would be a good guess? Um, in the first p coordinates, the inner product is, uh, is uh, positive, right? So I'll guess that I can conjugate it to a rotation by theta 1 rotation by theta uh, p, depending on p, whether p is even or odd, actually I might have to put a plus or minus one here. Um, and then what should the rest look like? Ah, uh, let's see. No, it's... So this will be again a rotation. This is also this is negative definite. So that's not quite the answer. Ah, so maybe uh, let's look at the case when P is equal to Q is equal to 1. 2 by 2 matrix mm -hmm. that preserve the inner product uh, uh, x squared minus y squared is equal to 1, as opposed to x squared plus y squared equal to 1. Mm -hmm. What matrices do that? have to replace cosine and sine with something else. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. Hyperbolic cosine and sine, right? So it should be something of the form of cos t. And now I'm not sure about the signs, but uh, if you have a minus sign here or not. Probably not with you, I guess. Maybe a plus sign. But Ah, 
Ah, yes. So it has to be plus. Right. So this should be uh, O plus 1, comma 1. SO plus 1, comma 1. That's determinant 1. Um, why does it have to be SO plus, even without looking at the picture or anything? How can I deform that matrix? Change T again, right? Make T go to 0. I connect to the identity matrix. So this matrix must lie in the identity component. So it has to lie in here. You can see right away, for example, it's not compact now. So T again can be any real number, it's a non compact group. So these groups are quite different, but just as important. Uh, the algebra, so I have OV, I have OP, comma Q, and of course I have a Lie algebra OV. So those are ele elements in uh, um, endomorphisms of V. So differentiate the asymmetry equation. That will be skew-symmetric. But you have to be careful when this is not a, is a PQ. It's not quite the usual kind of skew-symmetric. Uh, and then what's the Lie algebra of OPQ? So those are the n by n matrices. Uh, and I'll differentiate the. Um, to find the equation I had earlier for the orthogonal, so this was I EQ A is equal to zero. So it's Q-symmetric in this modified form if you want to write. So, yeah, those are kind of clearly the algebras. Interesting facts that you see here right away here, what happens, these are called, of course, real D algebras. What happens when I complexify? What happens with the P and Q when I complexify? So remember, in this, so in this vector space, when I talked about an orthonormal basis, these had lengths 1, these had lengths minus 1, had the first P at lengths 1, the last Q at lengths minus 1. Over the complex numbers, that doesn't make sense. Well, it makes sense, but uh, I can change that. Right, as I could uh, take the first, take my real orthonormal basis, and then multiply the last ones by i. It will be the same as O P plus Q. Yes. So now this is a complex basis of the complexification, which is a usual orthonormal basis. They all have lengths one now. So I claim this isomorphic to O P plus Q comma C. So over complex numbers, signature doesn't make sense. So if you want to have only O n comma C, that's all I have over the complex numbers. And all these Lie algebras here, so O P comma Q is one Q, when I complexify, I get O n comma C. So in our previous language, all these are real forms of this complex Lie algebra. So in general, I expect many real forms or given the algebra. Um, let's 
not quite so obvious why they're different as really algebras. So then it's OP comma Q isomorphic to OP bar Q bar. Of course, the natural guess would be certainly if they're the same, right? That's certainly. What else can I do? Make them look the same. Switch them. So P is uh, Q bar, and Q is uh, P bar. So it just corresponds to multiplying the product of minus one if you want to. Right? P positive Q negative is as more or less, more or less the same between as P net negative and Q positive. It's just a convention where you put the pl plus signs in your indefinite product. And that should be different only if. Like these are the only isomorphisms. That's not so clear. They have the same class complexification, so you can't see it that way. You have to study them as really algebras. And uh, I'm not sure what the simplest proof is. What would be a suggestion? How I could prove something like that. Uh, does this equation preserve that? It's Q symmetric. Does it preserve that? Nevertheless, that's probably a, uh, a good idea. Well, of course, I mean, uh, there may not be any relationship between the inner products a priori. Right, I have a here signature, here signature. I have an isomorphism of these really algebras. That doesn't mean the inner products are related at all. So it's not so clear if that helps. What's an invariant of Lee algebra? Simple invariant of Lee algebra we've seen. The automorphism group, but that might be hard to compute. The killing form, maybe. So one suggestion would be compute the killing form. But that's a symmetric bilinear form. Maybe study its signature, for example. The signatures are the same, then the groups are different. Um, this might be the simplest idea. I'm not quite sure what the killing form of all these OPQs look like. There'll be another way we can prove this. Just a state of theorem. So maybe A, if uh, A is, um, is a matrix, Do you know what the polar decomposition is of a matrix? The polar decomposition of a matrix. What is that? I can write A as what? Times a positive definite symmetric matrix. Exactly. So one way of saying that is uh, I can write A as R times E to the S, where R is orthogonal, and S is symmetric. So here I'm, I'm using another trick that I can write something that's positive, definite, and symmetric as E to something that's just symmetric. 
and this unique. And part B is uh, if uh, A lies in uh, OPQ, and I write down this unique polar decomposition. Now I can ask, well, if uh, what is R and S are uniquely determined? What are the properties of R and S? So let's see that R lies in OP, OQ, and has that matrix form. And again, S is symmetric. So that R has uh, 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 useful consequences. So corollary, uh, GLNR is diffeomorphic to ON across the field and vector space of a certain dimension. Symmetric matrices, what is that? N times N plus 1 over 2, I guess. means that GLN has two components. Because ON does. Positive negative return, return, that's all you can do. Uh, if I look at SLNR, I claim this also follows that this is SON cross uh, one less. So it's connected. But if you realize an SON, I take that of this, um, then uh, what is that of e to the s? Is that e to the traces? So in any case, so what, what you want to show is that r lies here, is where r sits, and uh, trace of s must be zero because it turns one, so that's two things you'd like to, like to show uh, uh, if it's uh, in SLNR. And here it says that uh, OP comma Q is diffeomorphic to OP cross OQ cross the Euclidean space of the appropriate dimension for some n, right, what, whatever the appropriate dimension is. Well, actually, n is symmetric again, so it's n plus n times n plus 1 over 2. Particularly, it's four components. Okay. And this is like a compact subgroup inside this here, and the rest is just Euclidean vector space. Okay. So it kind of tells you something about the topology of this manifold, what it looks like. And it looks like a certain compact group, and these, the compact group here is. O and S O N here are the product of two orthogonal groups. Um, so another way, if I want to show they're not the same, O P Q for different P and Q, I can look at the Lie group. Right? If the Lie algebra is the same, well, the Lie group would be the same up to covers. So I have to show that. OP cross OQ can't be the same as OP prime cross OQ prime unless P is the same or interchanged. Well, so that's, a, that's a topology of the Thorne group again. I have to know a little bit more about the topology, topology of the Thorne group in order to make a proof out of that. But anyway, so these are the various Thorne groups for positive, definite, and signature inner product. And then you can do the same thing with the complex numbers, unitary groups, the signature. Okay, I'll continue. Maybe uh, um, most of you have seen this before, this kind of polar decomposition. I have a proof in my notes, so take a look and, and read it. And do this as an exercise here. So in other words, once I have this, I know this de decomposition exists. Now put it in the condition that A transpose I, A is I, right? and see what it says about R and E to the S. That R looks like this, and S, this, this doesn't change. I think this is one of the exercises. So let's just uh, accept that and then go on next week with different kinds of Lie groups. Okay.